Hey, welcome to part two. You know, there are a number of important productions which feature Rogers and Hart music, and perhaps the, the breakthrough, one of the first big ones, was a Connecticut Yankee in 1927. Um, with all of these, we're talking about music by Richard Rogers and lyrics by Larry, Larry Hart. Um, Rogers would only write his own lyrics on rare occasions. Um, uh, Connecticut Yankee is what you would think. It is an adaptation of a popular story by Mark Twain in which a young man is conked on the head in what was considered at, at this point uh, current times and wakes up in the time of King Arthur and because he has knowledge of little everyday pieces of science and other facts he's sort of heralded as a wizard in this earlier time period. Um, it kind of has, uh, the way Robertson Hart put it together, it has a sort of a Wizard of Oz characters before the fantasy sequence all kind of become recast as characters inside of it and the, char and the main character sort of decides that he doesn't want to be engaged to this young lady. It's, he gets conked on the head with a champagne, a little bottle of champagne at his, uh, at his engagement party, and that's how he gets knocked out, wakes up in King Arthur's time. Um, in any case, uh, the piece was successful perhaps in large part because of uh, some wonderful songs in it. And one of them I have connected to our module. It's one of my favorite Rogers and Hart pieces, and it's certainly indicative of Hart's very dark sense of humor. You will see a piece called To Keep My Love Alive. Um, any of you who are aficionados of the King Arthur legend and that sort of thing, uh, Morgan Le Fay's character sings this song about how she was married so often and had to kill basically all of the, the young men that she was married to from person to person. Uh, Hart comes up with clever ways to bump these people off and clever rhymes to talk about it, and it makes for a great audition song. Um, this show becomes significant again because it would be revived later, and, and I'll talk about that at the end of this module. Um, On Your Toes is a very important piece from 1936, and let me tell you why. Um, you might notice I had credited up there that it's choreographed by George Balanchine. Um, On Your Toes is a piece about a vaudeville tap dancer played by Ray Bolger. He would later be the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Um, anyway, this character falls into the ballet troupe. They're accidentally booked to the same theater, and the ballerina, the head uh, ballerina in this group, teaches him some ballet. She teaches him some tap. They fall in love. They discuss their differences about the types of dance that they're both interested in. A lot of classic swing tunes in between. And in order to make it authentic, uh, Rogers and Hart wanted to have someone come on board to do the choreography. Up until this point, this show comes out in 1936. Choreographer is not a person who is a part of the major creative team of a musical until this show. Um, Balanchine came from the Russian opera. He was this tall, imposing, bald, deep-voiced, really, really serious-looking character. And he had a huge reputation to maintain with the ballet. And a lot of people thought doing a musical was beneath the, the skills and dignity of a good choreographer. And Balanchine said, well, I will do this for you because it's largely about dance and also because I want the opportunity to be billed as part of the creative team, to have my name as the choreographer in big print in the program as the major person who con contributed to the creation of this show. And since that happened with Balanchine, it happened very successfully. Uh, Richard Rogers was a pioneer in this. He would later seek out other people from the ballet, uh, a famous choreographer named Agnes DeMille, for example, and several others. And who your choreographer was became as important as who your composer is and who your lyricist is and who your director is. And that carries on to this day. There are a number of composers now who, as you know, I'm sure, have made a name out of, uh, or rather choreographers now, who have made a name out of, out of doing work on stage and being known for that. Um, there are a number of, of, of lovely songs in uh, Connecticut Yankee, but there are also just as many in, 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 uh, in On Your Toes. Uh, you find a piece called Slaughter on Fifth Avenue, which is kind of a famous dance piece in and of itself. It's about five or ten minutes long, and it's often done independently. And the show was a very, very big success for Rogers and Hart, and it kind of put them into a position where they were sort of a go-to popular collaborative team. You also see over here that I have listed that their follow-up show is called Babes in Arms. Babes in Arms is a great score. It's not a terribly great script, in my opinion. The plot is kind of silly. You have a couple of characters in the movie version played by uh, Vicki Rooney and Judy Garland, who are the children of vaudevillians. 
They overhear that their parents have left that at home so they can tour on the circuit. See, thanks to Hacker Zucker, you get to do that. And the kids kind of believe that their parents are in tax trouble and that they need money or else they're going to lose the family home. So they agree they're going to put on a show so that they can raise money for their family. And at one point, a, an, a, they, they put on the show and almost no one comes to see it. This crazy aviator who's you know, goggles and a scarf crash lands in a yard. He sees it and he loves it and he's rich and he gives them $50,000 for the escape. Um, but the plot is less important than the songs. Virtually every song in Babes in Arms became a hit, uh, particularly a swing jazz hit covered by the likes of Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, Big Crosby, those types. Um, some songs that are included in Lady and the Tramp include, uh, yeah, in Babes in Arms include The Lady is a Tramp, not to be confused with the Disney title, the, uh, the popular swing song. It also contains a great uh, swing number called Johnny One Note. Again, Larry Hart comes up with this idea of this character who can only sing one note, and he makes the best of it. Um, I wish I were in love again. Uh, Where or when is a lovely ballad. And then we get to My Funny Valentine. Again, classic Lawrence Hart. This character is saying, you know, you, you're, is your figure less than Greek? Is your mouth a little weak? Is this a character who's not terribly good looking, but yet they're the person for this other person? And they're willing to overlook those things. My Funny Valentine is the second most covered song in American recording, or in world recording. Even. I know what you want to know. The answer is Yesterday by the Beatles is the most covered song by other artists. But My Funny Valentine has been covered by a wide range, particularly of jazz performers and folks in the uh, in the jazz scene. Uh, it's a beautiful song. Um, it's another song that I'm going to attach to this unit. I'm sure you may have heard it before. So if you find a version that you like better of this song, maybe we'll uh, have a discussion about that. Uh, Babes in Arms is frequently performed, even today, by colleges, communities, those kind of things, largely because of the songs that are involved and the kind of material that, uh, that offers people a chance to sing. And it's, it's got a great score. And there have been rewrites upon rewrites of the script. So you may have done a version of this script that didn't feature the exact same series of events, the exact same plot, but it almost always will feature these and other great Rodgers and Hart songs. Um, perhaps it was Rodgers' uh, idea to always look out for new things. Perhaps it was Larry Hart's self-destructive nature trying to, to challenge himself. To, uh, but Pal Joey from 1940 is a really interesting and weird kind of a play. Rodgers and Hart th th thought to themselves, what would happen if we did a musical where the main character was completely and utterly dislikable, was a complete anti-hero, and the audience was forced to root against the main character rather than for them. To this end, they created a play based on a book by a man named John O'Hara, called Pal Joey, in which this character Joey is, well, he's a little sexist, he's very direct, he's kind of rude, and he's really just determined to use people in his sort of rise to the top. He wants to be a nightclub singer. And he basically goes through a lot of different people uh, taking advantage of them to become a famous singer. Um, to that end, he meets up, among other people, with a, an older woman named Vera. Her husband is uh, wealthy and probably connected to organized crime. And she kind of has a, a scene, a monologue, and eventually a song where she says that she knows full well that she is not as attractive as Joey, that Joey is not, is, is dramatically younger than she is, and that it probably will lead nowhere, but that she's happy to be used by him. She knows that he's using her, and she's happy because she feels she's using him as well. Um, critics said it was difficult to get water from such a poisoned well, they said. A little bit of a banter from, uh, from pal Joey. Uh, there's a scene where one of the characters, uh, a young woman, Joey is being welcomed into one of many nightclubs that he's got to work at. And, he said, and she says, oh, uh, my, my sister knows all about you. You worked at the club down the street, the Palmetto. Oh, which one was your sister, says Joey. And she says, the only one who didn't sleep with you. To which Joey very quickly responds, oh, the ugly one. Um, that's kind of the way that banter goes in that show. And it was not a huge financial success. Kind of weird, the lead character in this, playing Joey, was an actor named Gene Kelly. Um, he would kind of go on to play nothing but nice guys in the future. But it features some wonderful songs, including Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered, um, and I Could Write a Book. Um, other songs that sort of have that, that Rodgers and Hart lilting swing. A lot of their stuff is written for a very spare, piano-based drum jazz kind of an arrangement. 
Um, although there's some lush strings that are put underneath some of them, it has a very specific sound to it, though. And the most important thing is when you listen to it, I think you'll agree that it sounds very different from Rogers and Hammerstein. And that's by design. That's specifically for a very specific reason. Um, the story goes that a Connecticut Yankee was slated for a revival. It was slated to come back uh, in the 1940s. Um, and when it, was, when, when it was brought back, uh, they hired Rodgers and Hart to write a couple of new songs for it. Rodgers and Hart had also been hired to produce another new musical with a very strict deadline. And I'll be getting to that in, in, in just a moment or two. But um, at the opening night of the revival of uh, Connecticut Yankee, uh, Mr. Hart showed up very seriously inebriated and was ushered out. He was also an hour late. And when he left, he sort of disappeared. He was gone for days. He was found. Um, there, there was a, a hotel room that was found. It was clearly registered to him, full of bottles. And the door had been left open. And it looked like some scenes, some evidence of some sort of a struggle. We're not sure if it was him making a giant scene in the mess all by himself or someone assaulting him. He was eventually found not far from there on a park bench, uh, very seriously inebriated and uh, wrapped in a blanket that he had taken from the hotel. He was brought to a hospital where he died. And uh, Rogers kind of felt a little bit responsible, although I don't think that he was. He sort of said, oh, if I had just watched him, if I had just done something. But he was doing things for him all the time. And this was not the first such event. Uh, Hart had disappeared to Mexico City for a couple of days. Uh, at another point, he had disappeared in the streets of Los Angeles once before, and always with the same sort of pattern. And usually, Rogers would find him and would kind of, you know, um, tell him, you know, discourage him from from destroying himself. And in this one instance, he he was not able to do that, and it's kind of a disappointment because you know R Rogers sort of beat himself up about it. Now, there came to be uh, in the 1940s um, an organization called the Theater Guild. Now, let's not be confused with the, the theater guild here in Emmanuel or anyplace else. This theater guild was actually a working theater in repertory. It had a series of actors that came in and out and uh, its own building. And the theater guild is perhaps best known first for putting on the early production of Porgy and Bess and failing and losing an awful lot of money in New York. Uh, the theater guild would go on to produce a couple of other shows that would not be so successful. And they went to Richard Rogers and they said, we need you to rescue us. We need you to produce a show that with your name on it, maybe you and Larry Hart, because this is, of course, well, they were still together, and, and we want you to, to, to help us turn our fortunes around, and we need it to open by this particular date. Hart probably didn't respond so well to all that pressure. I'm not saying that that led Hart to this bender and this disappearance, but these things are right around that time period that are all happening at the same time. In any case, the play that they were going to look at was a play called Green Grow the Lilacs. It was by an author named Lynn Riggs. Uh, Mr. Riggs, his name was Lynn, but he was in there. He was uh, mostly known for writing plays about the Cherokee and Native American experience in the United States. He himself had grown up in, with uh, Native American heritage, and he wanted to write plays. He said he would write one play without Native Americans in it as a challenge to himself, and it wanted to be a play about how he viewed the non-Native American culture, how he viewed the, 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 non, the, the white uh, population. And he wrote this play, Green Grow the Lilacs, and he wrote it about largely the dispute over land between different people who were settled in parts of the American West. Um, in any case, when Larry Hart died, Rogers was still under contract to produce this play. And he wanted to, to stop writing Richard Rogers. He said he, at this tragedy, he wanted to buck away. He didn't want to write anymore. And it was only because he was obligated to come up with this play that he kind of had to finish it. And he had to seek out a new uh, collaborator because he still didn't feel like a lyricist, that he could do that strong enough. And so he thought back, and he recalled a time when he had written one of his amateur shows for you know boys clubs and students and that sort of thing how one of the judges for that show was a man named Oscar Hammerstein. And he found Oscar Hammerstein and said, you may remember me, you, you reported favorably on my amateur show, and I'm sure you've heard of me now, because I've been very successful. 
Hammerstein himself was very successful. He had done Showboat. He had done a number of other very, very successful musicals. And he said, oh yeah, I remember you. We should work together. And they began writing back and forth about ways to fix Green Grill the Lilacs and to bring it to the stage. Originally, they, the first thing they discussed, discussed was that the title was terrible. And so they would write back and forth. They came up with a new title called Away We Go. Yes, I know. You have never heard of Away We Go. So the letters would continue back and forth between Rogers and Hammerstein. And they would say things like, regarding Away We Go, regarding the place set in the West, and more frequently than not, regarding the place set in Oklahoma. And it would go on to say, regarding Oklahoma play. And eventually one day, Oscar Hammerstein said, why don't we just call it Oklahoma? It might make a lot more sense. And they agreed with that, and they added a little exclamation point at the end, and it became one of the most important and enduring musicals in American theater history. Um, I have said before that you have Black Crook, Showboat, Oklahoma, and Company as your four major you know, milestone uh, pieces in this, in this sort of history, in this narrative. And Oklahoma is just that. It's a huge, big deal. And many people dismiss it as sort of this G-rated kind of boring show about cowboys. They don't quite understand the appeal. Uh, I will do my best in our next unit to help explain the appeal of Oklahoma. But consider, Richard Rogers was working with a play that no one liked the title, with a brand new collaborator. He did a piece that had no major chorus girl jazzy dance numbers in it, kind of an operetta in its own right. It's surprising that Oklahoma succeeded as well as it did, but in winning the Pulitzer Prize, in putting major, major box office money together and becoming one of the biggest hits in the 1940s and subsequently, kind of changed history with that. Um, it's a tragedy about the Lawrence, the Lawrence Hart story. I'm going to suggest in our, um, in our discussions that perhaps we can look for some some hard music, and you're probably going to find again a real, a real beat, a real way with words that's kind of unique, different even from Porter or the others. Um, but you'll also see that Richard Rogers, he said, "Well, I'll I'll do this, but I want this stuff to sound completely unique from anything I did with Lawrence Hart. I think in respect to him and in respect to my own sanity, I want to develop a new sound. And Oklahoma doesn't sound anything like Al Joey or any of those shows. It really has a much bigger, broader orchestral sound to it." And I think you'll find it very distinct when you start listening to them. So thanks for listening to me. And the next time that you tune in, so to speak, we'll be still talking about Richard Rogers, but it'll be about his career with a different lyricist. It'll be about Rogers and Hammerstein.